Hey everybody, how are you doing today? Um, I hope you all had a great weekend. Mine was pretty good, to be honest. Um, except now it's really feeling like summer here. It's getting really hot. But 
that's all right. Um, another thing is, <laughs> I noticed for some reason Visual Studio recolored this text, and so I've been trying to figure out. So you can go into Tools and Options, and but you have to find like what this is supposed to be referred to as to this big list, and I was trying to trying to find it, but. I don't know, I already spent about five minutes trying to do this. That's why <laughs> stream's a bit late, but uh, I'm not sure. Like I would have th thought this would be like a instance variable, but there's nothing in there. I mean, in this list. So I'm sorry if not super easy to see because I don't even like it, but maybe I'll, um, uh, no, not that. And maybe I'll just increase the size of the text and hopefully that'll make it more visible. That's not these user types, that's like the definitions. Yeah, I don't know. I use basically the default dark coloring, so I don't know why it would have this maroon color in there but anyway I hope that it's somewhat visible I'll have to figure it out later but oh and I need to tweet out that I'm live real quick Okay. So yesterday, or not yesterday, I guess it was Friday, we started working on updating the ability scripts to, or the ability selection to the new system. And, but I completely forgot about the pathfinding, so we ended up doing most of the, or spending most of the day on that. Um, I'm pretty sure it's complete though. Yeah, so we visit a bunch of nodes, and then it gives us first search has three, which I think that's just one distance, and the second search is like all paths, so that's why it's nine. We'll be able to test to see exactly what's in there pretty soon, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. I guess I'll clean up some of these debug logs. Or I forget to later. Oops. Okay, so what I need to do now. The script calls to see if an ability is usable. Now is um finished so what I need to do is actually make like a, some small little interface to actually select an ability because right now I can click on a monster and it moves to choose ability mode so that's all working Select ability. I think I already updated this class as well. Really, all it does is it waits for um, okay. Yeah, if we press the back button, then it would go back to the monster selection. That's what this does, but then it waits until something calls this onset ability command, which I guess is going will be triggered from the interface. Let's look at that. I guess technically this should be inside the UX namespace. Uh, 
So I'm kind of treating this as like the art and sound of the map, and then this is more, I'll keep the UI separate. Okay, so anyway, this, this is a window. I remember the Unity, um, I'm using Unity's UI system and although I do like it, it was not really working to how I wanted it. I'm trying to remember what was wrong. I wanted it to like automatically stretch the buttons to go across the window, but to only use the minimum requested space from a button and I couldn't get that to work I think and then so the offsets got all weird and I didn't really worry about it too much because it was very temporary interface so I might just um, do that or use that same philosophy here okay, so I don't need those messages because that's the old system Okay, and this is actually a mono behavior. That makes sense. That means I can't use... Um, like, I can't use the automatic argument. Or what's it called? Uh, dependency injection. Because you can't call a constructor on a mono behavior, unfortunately. But yeah, so this is obsolete. Okay, so what I need to do... Get the context... Hmm, okay, so I need to get the context of the... The play scene, so because yeah, this current selection scope won't exist when the game starts up. Okay, so let's. I'll just. Um, I guess I'll just get that later. Can't do that right now. Oops. So these variables are defined when the game starts up, so it's safe to get them right here. Okay, so yeah, I need some event. Okay, and then this subscribes to something ability usable update. Let's see. I think I did have an event for that. The uh, in here. Yeah, ability usable update event. Okay. So I'll subscribe to this event. Okay, so Oh, except and since this is a mono behavior, I can't use the same type of setup. I wonder... The only really reason I need this to be a mono behavior is so that I could get these objects from Unity. So I think a better way, or an easier way to do this, so I can easier use the event system with the rest of the game, is to kind of block that off. Something like that, and then we'll just have a reference to this. I think that should work. Okay, so now we can use a constructor here. Let's copy and paste. Okay, so now I can use dependency injection, so I'll have battle and game data and I guess 
Okay, so I can create this class during the play scene, so I can go ahead and grab the scope at this point. And then I just need to pass the events up to the parent object. Oh, yeah, it's being confused by that void keyword. There's no return type on a constructor, obviously. Okay, so I don't need to do this. Um, I just will store these values from the arguments. Wrong key. Okay, actually, I think I'll rename this to um, the choices. It's the better match the variable or the object type. Okay, so here I don't need... Oh, I guess I do need this, though. Although... I think it's called... Yeah, results cache. Okay, so now I don't need to grab it there because that's the old system. Okay, so I guess I'll need to listen for when we enter the phase. That makes sense. Add, um, so we'll want to listen for all events of the um, ability usable update event. Okay, so this is basically just seeing if we're end phase, and if we are, then we need to refresh the list. Okay, let's just say on usable update. Oh gosh, I really messed that one up. So I guess I really don't need this event because really I just refresh the entire list. Okay, so I don't need to use an all events listener. I can just listen for an event exists. Okay, so I just realized another variable I need here is the... Um, the selection state. Guess I don't need the namespace for that. And okay, so for here, I would just check if we're in um, the choose ability, then I would refresh the list. Okay, so what this does is that if we're in or if we enter the choose ability state, then I need to show the window and refresh the list. Okay. I actually don't get a reference to the window just yet. Fine. And so for this, um, I'll just use the find object of type, which will just search through the current scene in Unity for a mono behavior of this type. Um, there's cleaner ways we could do it, but this will work fine. Okay, so. Oh, are they private? Okay, so I need to make these public. Now you could technically get rid of the serialized field um, attribute, but I kind of like um, 
to keep it there to be explicit. Okay, what's this complaining about? Oh, okay. I guess this doesn't need to be public. Okay, and then, yeah, I guess I do need to set it hidden when this starts up. I might want to actually do that in here because this loads at the beginning of the game, but this class will only load when we enter in the play state. So let me see. Wait. Start. Oops. We'll just hide this when the game starts up because it doesn't need to be visible. Okay, so I don't need that. And I need to subscribe to when the phase updates. Player selection. Is this the right one? I actually need this one, so control choice. Okay, so what else do I need to do here? Okay, so this instantiate object, our method doesn't exist anymore, so I just need to call our explicitly um, call the game object. And then the button prefab and button parent I have to get from the window object. Okay, and so, oh yeah, and I need to that okay, I guess I changed the name of this okay I should rename this instead of try get I'll just use get state that always returns a state Okay, and then this on button clicked. Okay, so this... Uh, actually, when is this called? I was going to say this is a Unity event, but I think it's actually called from the uh, ability select button. Yeah, right here. Okay, so we could just have the button throw the event itself, but I think it might be better if the button did call this function somehow. Let me see. So now I need to give the button, well, let's just assume that the button somehow gets an it's gets this ability select window instance. So now I can just call an event or fire an event. Public class ability window button clicked. And we'll just want to pass the ability index, I think. We actually pass the in window index, which I assume is the same as the ability index for the button. Or on that monster. Yes, this is. Um, gotta be careful about the name here because it's not gonna be the abilities index. In the ability database, it'll be the monsters, or the ability index on the monsters ability list. I guess I'll just rename this to button index. Uh, 
I don't know, that's probably not the best either. I could just pass the ability index in the database, that so would work as well. What? Ability, window, button clicked. Okay, so I think this class is all done. So the select button that I need to do... Okay, so it has the ability select window, which is the Unity object. Which I guess it, it really doesn't need. So I'll just change this. And the only reason we need to do this is because Unity will call this on click function. What's this complaint about? Oh. Okay, well, this actually has to be public. Kind of annoying. But the reason we have to do this is because the buttons just need some way to call this class. Because Unity routes a click event into the mono behavior. Okay, so this is going to cause a cascade, because now this is going to complain about player selection states, not public. So if I make this public, is that the end of it? Okay, yeah. I thought that, well, I was afraid that when I did that, then it would say one of these enumerations needed to be public, and then that would cause like a cascade of different errors between other objects, but luckily that didn't happen. Okay, so it's, it's still compiling. Looks like that's good. Okay, so let me make sure that the window is still set up. It's right here. So I guess I just need to create this uh, ability select window logic class. Or instantiate it, I should say. Um. Oh, yeah, it's here. What's it complaining about? Does not exist. Oh yeah, it's not in selection, it's in the play UI. Okay, so let's see what happens. Okay, it does show up. And again, it's really... It doesn't look very good, but that's okay. I don't really care at this point. But now this move action is available. And so if I, well, actually if I click it, nothing will happen because I haven't set up everything, but okay. So it's going to say, yeah, ability window button clicked. can see actually let me look if I open up the scene I wonder like if I'm ray casting and I move the mouse over a UI object if the ray cast still goes through I have a feeling it will yeah so it's still going through that might cause an issue later but right now it will be okay the problem is when I click on this move, I kind of want the game to assume that anything under this UI element, I didn't click. But right now, I could click both at the same time. But I think that in the ability select phase, there's nothing else I'd want to click besides this button. So it's not going to cause an issue. 
Um, but yeah, that might be something we have to come back to. Alright, so let me see. And I guess... Yeah, that could be a kind of annoying issue. But, yeah, I don't want to spend time on it now. So what I need to do... Go back to the selectability manager, and now I just need to subscribe to the window button clicked event. Okay, so what was it? Ability, select. Oh, well, it's in the play UI namespace, so I guess we'll get that first. Okay, so let's just create a new method. Okay, and we'll just, this already checks to make sure we're in the right phase, so I'm not gonna do it again, but we'll just say on set ability command. So we've got to tr um, translate from the window button index to the ability ID, which is not that difficult. I guess we just need to get the monster object first. Oh, I don't have a reference to the battle. Okay, so now that I have that, I can get the monster index from the current choices. Okay, and then the ability ID is just the monster abilities, and then whatever the button index is in here. Yeah, this isn't like, I don't think this is the best way to do it, but I guess whenever I come back and make a better interface, which is probably not that far down the list of to do of things to do, we can fix this as well. But anyway, so when we click this, it will call this forward event, which should bring the game to the select targets mode. Which will hide the window and then bring up a bunch of little indicators of where the monster can move. Not right now, but once we do it. Okay, so yeah, it's choose option now. And if I press escape, oh, well, nothing happens because I haven't finish the choose option controller, but you see, um, ability, select monster, okay, select target. I guess I'll rename this. I've kind of gone with option instead of target because it's more like Um, I don't know which flavor of ab of the ability do you want to use. C could be more than just a target. Okay, so this first calls the Lua to see which targets are available and then creates... Um... creates indicators for that and then listens to see um, if we press a button on a valid option 
but I guess the question is, do we want to have that all in the same phase? Because what I could do... Okay, let's comment this out one more time. Well, I'll just leave it. Okay, so I could insert something here that's like generate options and then choose option, which I think I might do. That way it's easier to control having another um, like separate classes for that because the option manager already has like two states, generate option and then listen for input. So I might as well make that a little more bite sized and easier to deal with. Okay, so how do... Um, let me see, what is the class that listens to this? I can't remember the name. Okay, well that's not true, something else does listen to it. Oh, I guess I was searching for the constructor, okay. Yeah, the choice control manager, this is what I was looking for. So when ability is chosen, we actually will advance, not to choose option, we'll advance to generate options. Okay, and then that's still fine. Option chosen. So if option is canceled, we would switch back to choose ability, yeah, because we would clear the options and then go backwards. need to insert one other thing here so on options generated oh I see yeah we don't want to do that we actually still want to just advance the phase because advanced control will actually switch the player that's controlling but we would switch to uh, choose option now because the options are done. Okay. So I guess I just need to create a new class for that. So I know I did something similar here, but... I have this options generator, which generate basically does exactly what I'm going to do. But it calls it for every class that needs to be done. So I really just need like something like this, but only calls. Um, for the class that we actually care about. And I guess only if the cache hasn't already generated that. So let me see. Um, okay, why don't I was thinking that I might use this class and copy and paste it as a base, but I think that's just going to be more confusing. Okay, so let's say, let's just call this select options generator. Or we could either just, even just go with options generator, but. So this class again is just basically enables the event system in my game. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to... Okay, well, let's wait to generate a constructor actually. So what we'll need here is the... We'll need a couple things from this action sequencing namespace. 
the ability get options lua collar and um we'll need i guess that's it from there but we'll need this lua cache and then also the player selection state and the current selection choices that might just about do it and then of course i need to add in the event queue because for some reason that code generator does not take into account what my parent class requires, which is a little a shame. Okay, um, so the first thing I know I need to do is I need to wait until um, we enter in the right phase, so it'll be a new event exists listener. So what's it? Choice, control, it's something like control, manager, change. There we go. And we pass the events and then on phase change. Okay, so if state equals what I want to do. I need to get that. So if this equals generate options. Then I guess I'd start the Lua call. So let me see Lua caller call and I want to pass the monster and ability which I can get from here monster and choices dot ability and this will get yeah, returns and open call helper so if we'll just get that one Uh, let's rename this to active call. Okay, and also while I remember, I want to override the dispose function. And if um, active call is not null, then we want to dispose of it here. Um, let's actually extract this. So clear, that's fine. Um, okay, that's about it. So I guess I'll just want to clear it here. Um, actually, yeah, if it's not generate options and we want to clear. Yeah, so we can just do that. <laughs> Okay, and so now we just need to wait until this call is done. So easiest way to do that is check here. So if active, well, I guess we should just wait to see if we're in state. That's easier. State voice phase is generate options. Then if active call is complete, then we just ask the Lua caller to store the results from this. Um, I guess that's it. And so then I just clear and queue an event saying that we're done. That was actually pretty simple. Uh, oh, well, there is one other thing I need to do. Okay, so this just lets the outside world know that I'm done. But I guess, so we actually don't even need to call this if the cache already contains information for this monster and ability. So let me see, if cache dot 
Okay. Got to have like a dummy variable here because it has an out. Okay, so choices, monster, choices, ability, out, memory. What's it not like? There's no argument. Oh, I see. It needs an option index, which we don't have yet. So let's um, actually make another function here. Public bool has get options. That's fine, I guess. So really all I do is just return this cache contains Also, I've just realized I don't need to use this key object, so I can just use a vector to int. I guess that didn't exist at this point. Yeah, because these are just both integers, and that way I don't have to use my own hash key. I can just use whatever uh, Unity uses. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's basically equivalent, but I'm sure Unity has a better hash code and everything. Okay, so yeah, this basically just lets us know if we've ever stored any information for this monster and ability. Oh yeah, and so now I don't even need to have that dummy variable that we don't won't need to use. Okay, but yeah, if this is false, then we need to call this. Although, uh, let me see. So yeah, even if this has been generated, I guess we still need to call it because this doesn't contain like the indicator lists and everything now that i think about it yeah this only contains like the lua table memory okay so yeah never mind about that we can just get rid of that class because we don't even need it that reference. Okay, but we'll still want to store the memory here. Okay, so I guess I have this allow ability options, but I wonder did I actually implement everything that has to do with indicators yet? Let's look and see. So, um, oops, this is really small. Uh, can't you make it bigger? Zoom. Okay, probably better. Although the coloring in this Visual Studio Code is a lot better than Visual Studio itself. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um... Okay, so I'm trying to update this function, which basically, given an ability, we need to return like all the different options for this ability. And so when we ability usable, I did a pathfinding request. And basically the ability is usable if any paths are found. Um, but we don't want to have to 
recalculate this. So I stored it in memory, and then this memory is actually passed through to this function because it's the same monster and ability. Um, and so what I do here, I get all subpaths. And then if the ending node does not equal the monster's position, then that would be a valid place they can move to. Okay, so I have this ability options, and first you add an option here, and then you want to add some kind of indicator for it on the map, or so the player knows that they can actually click there. That's what this does, and so type, and get the position. And then for the specific option, I also store this memory so that I can grab it later here when I actually execute the ability. But I'm not sure if that's all implemented yet, so let's just take a quick look. Okay, so good target arguments looks fine. Okay, so I guess I did do it. Oh, right. This is when I actually made that extra data list for the ability calls. So all that happens is when we add an option, or basically yeah, call this function, it um, yeah, tags the this Lua call with some extra data and then stores that option in the list. So that's pretty easy to deal with. Okay, I just realized I made a mistake here. You always need to have a default constructor with no arguments. So that we won't allow Lua to, to create new instances of this class. But we don't actually want to use this, so I'm just going to tag it as not supported. Anyway, um, yeah, we just create a new option, and we need to pass this script, which is basically the Moonsharp's object for this specific Lua script, so that we can create a new um, Lua table here. Okay, and then this stores the indicators, which there. And so this basically just has a way to set a type and a position. So yeah, I think we're good to go. Okay, so now I need some way to translate these indicators into something that the game knows about or that the game logic can deal with. Which um, is this options generator. I think this class used to do it, but I think I'll just move it into the options generator because it's doesn't actually need to be there. Um, because these are two classes that do the magic. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay, so some of this stuff needs to be renamed, but it's a general idea. Okay, so let's see. Private void. Um, I guess read Lua options. From the active call, so I'd want to do that before I clear. So let's do the read the option. Okay, so go 
Okay, I see what that's doing. I guess, where do I want to store these? Do I have a class for that already? Okay, I have this, and... No, that's not what I want. Okay, so this is like an indicator object, but... Okay, I guess this was it. I don't really need to store the memory here, so I think I'll get rid of that. Then I need some class that I can actually store a list of this. Oh, the current selection choices has a list of these. Okay, so that's that will deal with it. Um, okay, so I don't really need to do this because the Choices already has that list. So just all options. I'll just clear it. Okay, so yeah, I need to get. Oh, I think this is in the user data subname space now. Yeah, so that's all I had to do there. And now I just need to get. Let's see. Um, Lua interface all. That's not it. Okay, so this is in the user data namespace. I think I might, I think I'll move this somewhere else. Except now I forget what it was called. Um, so get call get targets data. It does have its own file, I think. Uh, let's see. This might be not needed because this is in the user data namespace and it needs to be because I want anything that has that can be called from Lua to be in the namespace. Okay. Oh, uh, well, this is fine. So what I do is this active call, get extra data. Okay, now we'll get this. Um, yeah, just to clean this up a bit, I, I'll just use var, which basically, because we know that this type, what the var keyword does is basically just figures out that these types are supposed to be the same and just kind of cleans up your code a little bit. Okay, so data dot options. And if options are empty, then... Well, no, we wouldn't want to throw an error. Probably the interface would say, can't... Well, ideally, if there is no options, the game... The ability should have said that the ability wasn't usable earlier. But at the worst that happens is the game could just say a warning Press back, you can't use this ability, and then you just exit out to the previous phase. So I'm not going to worry about if there's no options in the list. Let's see, so choices, all options, add. Okay, 
Okay, so I don't remember. I don't really need to store this memory, so that's stored in the cache, which we called right here. Okay, so yeah, if the type. This shouldn't happen, right? Because I think I test that already. Yeah, here it's throws an error if there's a bad indicator type. Uh, but I guess, I don't know, if something got through. Probably sa better to be safe. Okay, so we need a board for that, so let's grab reference to the battle, it's no big deal. And the battle just has the current state of the game, basically, is what that class is. Current, yeah, of the, I guess, the play, the actual game, not like the entire program, if that makes sense. Okay, so I think we're done here. And I think I can finally clean this file up and get rid of all these comments. Okay. So after we read the Lua options, then we clear the Lua caller and we say that we're done. So I think I need to handle that event to be here. Okay, so we just need to listen to a new event here. Exists listener, um, so options generator dot complete. Okay, so let's just test this real quick. What should happen is once I select an ability, it will generate the options by calling this script. And then let's just have a print here, I guess, to make sure it's actually called. And then after that, I'll see in the debug log that the game has entered um, the next phase, which is the select option phase. Is this an error? Oh, right. Okay. I ended up not needing this class just yet. Okay. I didn't know one other thing I need to do. Subcontroller, I need to initialize the options generator class, otherwise, it won't ever run. So let's let it compile again. Uh, let's see. So it's stuck in generate options. Okay, uh, that's not what I was expecting to happen. The options generator reacted to the presence of this event, but it didn't actually call the the uh, Lua script, it seems like. Uh, 
Okay, let's do this. I'll just have this print out and it'll tell me if it's null or not. But more importantly, it will tell me if that code is ever ran. Okay, so it says, yeah, the open call helper, so that means it's not null. Then how come nothing ever happens? Okay, so I know that this function is called because in this base tick is when the event listeners fire, so since this is called, then we know that tick is called. So either, well, this can't be wrong because we got through this before. So I guess the active call or the Lua call is just never finishing. And so it's never being tagged as complete. So let me see. Print, we'll just print a path. And that keeps on going forever. Wouldn't make much sense, but I guess we haven't tested everything about the pathfinding system since I updated it, so something could be wrong there. Okay, well it's not printing anything. Okay, so that at least means it's not an infinite loop. Is there? Oh, you know what? I don't check for an error from the script, so yeah, that could be what's going on. Um, yeah, here. So if it's complete, yeah, I need to check if active call dot error type is none. Then we do that. Otherwise, we would want to queue the error. So events new internal. Oh, what is it? Exception. Forget the name of this. I think it's play exception event. Okay, that was pretty easy actually. Exception equals new. Okay, what's going on here? It's game is getting confused about something. Oh, there's an extra curly brace. Okay, so I wonder if I already have a type for this. Okay, now let's see. So I guess ability, get targets, script, exception, uh, not get targets, let's get options now. And then I want to pass, I didn't mean to type a dot there, that was supposed to be a comma. The uh, active call error type to string and then active call error type um, or error message. Let's generate that. Oh yeah, and I don't need a semicolon there. Okay, by the way, this, while I'm here, I should change this to get options just to keep the names consistent. Okay, so I bet that's what was happening. I was getting an error, so nothing was actually happening. Hmm. 
No, no error. Okay. Hmm. Then what is the issue? Because okay, let's just do this. Debug log. Oh wait. Community engine debug log active call is complete. So we should get a bunch of false. And then I'll need to look about why the script is hanging, which I'm not sure what would be going on with that. Okay, I thought I saw something I was not expecting in the log. Yeah, so now it just says false forever. So why is the script hanging? Because... When I printed, well, for one, um, we never get this get options is never, never called or never displayed. So we never actually call this function. Okay. Let's, did I mess up something here? Oh, okay. I know what I did. I forgot that this doesn't actually start the call. You have to call, uh, or you have to type the call message yourself. Um, where was I? So here, then I would just call active call. I feel like I'm saying call too much. Okay, start, there we go. Yeah, so I have to call this function myself. That's just because we might want to set up this call before actually starting it. Not in this case, but in other times I could see that happening. Okay, so yeah, that was a bit of a silly mistake, but I found out about that, or realized that exception error as well, so not a complete waste of time. Okay, so now we get an actual error. Let's see what's going on with this. Okay, so yeah, the path. Cannot convert user data. Ability usable arguments. When would that happen? So, okay, store memory at get options 57. I probably just put the wrong type. Obviously. Ability usable. Oh, that is the wrong one. So it should be ability get options. Okay, I need to rename that as well. And what's it not like? Okay, this is updating okay, and I should rename the file as well let's just rename this to ability option actually Let's just make these a little simpler. Okay, so this should be I add indicator and then the add option. Okay, I like that. Okay, so let's try this one more time.
Okay, so yeah, now it's switched. It's switched from generate options to choose options. I think I can look in here and see the current choices. Okay, this option, well, will be negative one when we're done, but yeah, we have five indicators that should show up. Okay, I think that these numbers are wrong. Because let me, like this is position zero, so this is one. And yeah, this is eight because it's eight wide. But I'm not sure where it's getting these from. So I'll need to look and see what's going on there. And what is this target index about? I'm just going to get rid of that. If something needs it later, we can add it back in. Okay, let me see. Okay, we probably got time to do a little more. So I guess I can start updating this class now, which now is going to be much simpler. So we don't need this because it just has one function now. It just listens for input. Uh, I don't need that anymore. I do need this, but we've changed it to current selection choices. I don't need any of these messages. OK, this is mouse fix state, which we do need. And I just change this to player selection state. Okay, so is there anything interesting here? Not really. So I think I'm just going to delete this and then regenerate the constructor. I'll need to add the event queue in it. All right, I need to actually parent or inherit from that so we can use the event system. Okay, so first of all, I know I need to subscribe to um, whenever the control phase changes. So what is that? Okay, and now I need to subscribe to the simple button triggered. Oh, um, all events listener. On. Okay, I don't know if it's back or select, so I'll just say on button triggered, not pressed. I'll just go ahead and create this so that it'll stop bothering me about that. Okay, so on phase change, what this does... Okay, so I definitely want to set option index to negative one. Let's close this. Yeah, when we enter in this, enter into this, we'll want to do that probably as well when we go in the options generator, just to make things clear. Oh, not ability options. And I probably should clear the list as well. Places, all options clear. Okay, so I won't want to clear the list here unless we're exiting back to abilities. So we all need to handle that separately.
Um, yeah, that's not what I'm trying to do. I need the state. Okay, so I don't need to call Lua anymore. So that makes that simpler. Okay, so I don't need to deal with this anymore either. Okay, so. If, oh, let's do a switch statement. E dot button. If back, then on back button press. Left click. Okay. So yeah, if we're in, choose options. Then I'll want to send an event go backwards. So let, I'll just use the same names as the ability manager to try and keep things simple. Um, oh yeah, sorry, my mind went blank there. It's a new back event. And I guess, well, do I want to clear? I guess it's safe to clear it when I go backwards, so I might as well. So we don't leave bogus data in there. Okay, so something similar here. Let's see, mouse, pick type, and yeah, I just made all this lowercase. Don't care about that anymore. Okay, so option equals. Okay, I see. So we get the selected from the block that the mouse was over. Let's just get rid of that. Just clean things up, because we pretty much know that that actually happened cause from this event firing. Forward event. Basically, here we need to loop through all options and see if there's one that matches this selection okay which looks fine okay so that was pretty simple i think so it would work now but um we won't actually see any of those indicators so i need to go and find the code that does that Selection. Oh gosh, I can't type. There we go. Okay, so let's see what else is in here. I wasn't sure if the code for the indicators was in selection, but it's probably okay. It's up here. So again, this is a mono behavior. I'll probably want to put the... Oh, it's not a mono behavior, actually. But then how is... I need to get a reference to this prehab, pre, prefab somehow. Okay, so let's see. Class, ability, indicator... Okay, I'll just call it parent, and this will be a mono behavior. Okay, and then the rest of this will be 
It's a normal flow logic container, so we can use events easier. I'm not sure what this list does, but I'll update it later. Okay, so this I need to change to be the constructor. Um, it doesn't really do anything special except create that list, so I'll just generate the constructor. Okay, um, so this dot shown prefabs and this dot parent will do another game object dot find or uh, ability indicator parent. And what's it not like about that? Oh, right, it's find object of type. Okay, so I guess I'd refresh when we enter. Okay, so the nice thing about this is that I don't have to have a special event to tell the indicators to refresh. I can just wait until um, we enter in the phase. So this listener phase. This will be in selection dot voice base change. All I have to do is um, if actually I don't have a reference to the state there selection state of that. Okay, so now the constructor is getting too big to fit on one line. Okay, so if state dot um, choice phase equals choose option, then we know that the options have been set up already, so I can just call refresh. And yeah, this will, okay, so all it does is just despawn everything and then regenerate them, which is fine. Okay, so I can just do parent dot, we'll probably change the way these prefabs work because we'll want mods to be able to load in something specific for this. Um, for yeah, every type of indicator. Okay, this is pretty long. So yeah, all this does is just create an indicator depending on what type you have set up. And then if the game object does not equal null, then we just set parent and set the position. So pretty simple. It's actually a lot more simple than I remembered. So now I just need to initialize this. And okay, so I need to go into Unity and set up that object now. It's an ability indicator parent. Oh, I know what's wrong. Okay, so. Okay, since it's a Unity, our mono behaviors, the script file name has to be the same as the mono behavior class. So, yeah, even though the creator is, I guess, the more important part of this, I think I'll just 
Uh, let's see. Let's rename this to Creator Logic. And then I'll just rename this to Creator. Okay. And then I'll rename this file again. Okay, so that works better. It's got to finish loading, I guess. Okay, there it is. Um, okay, so let's try this out. Okay, no, that worked actually. Okay, the reason these numbers were large, which I should have realized, is because it's just um, higher elevation. So, yeah, this. The pathfinding still works fine. Okay, so now we have five options. Uh, if I click here, nothing should happen because there's no um, option on that space, but if I click here. Yeah, it does a forward event. Okay, I see, but it didn't clear the indicators. Oh, well, actually, we're still in phase, so let's see. Um, so really, uh, I guess I could just call refresh every time this phase changes. Uh, it's not like... Yeah, and then it's, if our end state, then we would create more here. So if state choice phase equals choose option. Okay, so I don't need this on phase change after all. Okay, there we go. And then, um, Control manager just needs to listen for the forward and backward events. Event exists listener. Um, select option manager forward. Go on options chosen. I guess I should have checked to make sure that the state was set up okay, but we can do that in a second. Okay, so on option cancelled. Okay, so now option is negative one, but we have five options. So if I click here. It goes, so that's actually option one. Well, that makes sense because it's 73. And now, yeah, I went to inactive. Oh, uh, that's actually, okay, well, that's not correct, but it's fine for now. So, okay, so it actually fired that it was complete, but nothing listens to that yet, so that's okay. Yeah, no, nothing will happen. Let's test canceling out. Okay, so if I press escape, it switches back to ability. I can go all the way back to monster and choose more. Everything seems to work. If I press escape now, nothing happens because it's not in phase anymore. Okay. So, okay. What I thought was going to happen is that when this advanced control fired, it would say that um, it would run for the next player. But actually, I think what's going on is that the game is treating the second player as an AI right now.
Um, which is not what I want to happen because I don't really want to implement AI right now. So I want to be able to choose for it. So what I should do... Try to figure out where that is all set up. Like this lobby is pretty hacky right now. Okay, so it's... That's a parameters... Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, so the second player is set to AI right now, so I wonder if I just set this to player, will the game explode or will everything be okay? Okay, it's being stuck on assets loaded. Probably because it's trying to wait for a ready check for the second player, even though it's a local player. Okay, so how should I handle this? Because it's like... Okay, this is something I've wondered about. Because right now the battle players are kind of like tightly coupled to the clients on the server. But one client, because I want like the client ID to be the same as the player ID in the battle. But I guess probably a better way to do it would be the client has a list of players that it's acting under or that are contained on that client. I guess the question is, do I actually really want to worry about that? Because for AI, it doesn't matter because AI is just calculated on each local machine. So the only reason I want to do it is if I ever was going to have more than one player play on the same machine. Okay. Well, regardless, I don't really want to mess with that right now. Hmm. Okay, so I have a couple. Before I handled this by just setting that if the AI script was null, then you would just take control of it. So maybe that's how I'll deal with it. Okay, so let's see. Private pool is local controlling layer. So um, we'll switch battle. Let's actually get a reference to the player. So we need to switch the player type. Okay, so if it's local, then we'll return true. If it's... Okay, well, there's no such thing as local and online AI now. Yeah, I really need to go through and figure out... Probably sooner rather than later, the... Um, relationship between a player and the client and how I want to store all that data. But um, I guess for now, let's just loop it under the rug. So we'll control it if the player dot, um, um, their AI script is null. Uh, this is... Okay, so I guess, let's see, is this ever set? Okay, yeah, we just set it to negative one there. 
Yeah, I don't even deal with AI right now. I forgot about that. So actually, yeah, if the AI script index is less than one or less than zero, we'll control it. Um, okay, and so default. Okay, so hopefully this will let me at least take control of the second player. Not that I'll be able to do anything with it yet because the camera doesn't move. I guess that will be the next project. So, but at the very least... Okay, so now it's saying yeah, choose monster with player number one, which is the second player, but way over here so I can't actually click on it um, okay, that didn't work I trying to select monster one Let's see what's going on here. Okay, well, it's still saying the player is zero, which should not be true. Because yeah, it's saying, because the phase is for player one. So I guess maybe I never set that. for okay so here I should just set choices oh I don't even have a reference to it I guess I'll need one then okay so choices what's it current selection choices or Okay, let's actually a better way to do it is probably for this choice is just to not even include the player because it's redundant. Okay, so here, here. Instead of using that, we'll just use the state controlling player. Okay, let's see if anything else has a problem with that. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so now it's, now it's choose monster for player one. Okay, so I need to again move the camera over so I can, oops. Okay, there we go. And so, yeah, now let me choose that. Okay. Yeah, so now it's saying it's complete. Okay, that's good. Let's see, so what else? Okay, leave that there. Okay, so what's some other things I need to do? I need to do camera and I need to finalize relationship between Players and clients. Um, I guess should client have a list of players, and then yeah, think of hot seat and AI. Yeah. So the only reason that, like I said, the only reason we want to have that is if I ever had hot seat mode where two players shared a computer and took turns. Um, which, well, I am using that for testing, so if it's not too difficult, it might be a good idea just to support it right away. Let's take a look and see what would be required with that, since we're kind of, we finished the selection phase, so we're, we're actually going to move into generating actions. Um, almost caught up, actually, to where we were. 
before I did all these new events. Okay, well, let's first look in the lobby parameters. Okay, well, this actually doesn't really matter a whole lot on the client side. Because basically, the slots would be a player, so the slot would say, I guess... So if it was a hot seat slot, how would I send that data to the server? I guess it would be... I need to tag the slot as a guest. And then I would need to... Reference our... Tell what the parent slot was. Kind of confusing. Maybe I could do... I could have the parent username, maybe. Let's see. Public. Google is guest. Uh, let's... Okay. Well, a lot of other games use the term guest, but... Well, the thing is, yeah, these hot seat players wouldn't have their own username. So yeah, that's one thing. Okay, so I guess technically it would be a guest. And I guess if this is a guest, it would have a host. I don't really want to use the name host, actually, because that... That's a, that's like a term for the server and everything, so, okay. Um, so, on the server side, how it would deal with this. So, I just have the slot, which corresponds directly to the lobby. But if certain clients... Oh, these are actually the connections. Okay, so never mind. Okay, so I guess I would just... Uh, if it was a hot seat... I would... Mark it as a guest, I guess. And then I need to store the host host slot as well. Because uh, this is actually going to make things... Oh, well, actually, I don't know. Okay, well, we wouldn't actually... Okay, the thing about this is that a host client or a guest client does not have an associated connection, so we wouldn't actually ever receive messages for it. We'd receive messages from the parent client. So I'm not sure if the server even really needs to care about the guest. It would just not let anything else um, take that slot in the lobby. So yeah, let me think. here yeah we have a user end slot so really yeah, we need to pass the AI script across and I guess we do need to say that as a guest okay so let's see public cool is guest and then public string Current username. So the server won't really care about this. It'll just see, okay, this is a guest. Let's set the slot to um, taken or none, actually. 
Okay, got slip player and AI. Uh, should I have a separate guest type? Yeah, that way I wouldn't have to have. I think that might be the best, actually. So I don't really need this is guest, because a guest is by definition a player. Okay, well, actually, no, I don't want to do that because I think the game logic needs to know the difference between a player and an AI, but it doesn't actually care about if it's a guest or not. Yeah, this is. Okay, so, and then on the server here, we, when the server receives lobby parameters, it tries to make sure that the clients match up. So what I do here is if a user and slot and and our slot dot is guest is false. Or is that true actually? Okay, so what would happen here? Um, if it's a player, yeah, if it's none. Okay, well we need to make sure. So kind of, yeah, if the slayer, if the, or excuse me, if the slot is a guest, then we actually treat it like an AI in terms of the server. So, and slot is guest is false. So if, if it's a player and it's not a guest, then we'd actually register it. Okay, so if it is a guest, then it would go here. And basically, if the state is anything except none, then we'd want to disconnect any connection um, that is associated with this slot. Okay. And the server doesn't actually care about hosts. Okay, I think this will work. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can't test it right this second because it's getting late. I need to go and um, I guess wrap this up and grab a bite to eat and then get to work. But okay, well, that's not as difficult as I thought. So basically, it's just the client will treat a guest player as if it was an AI, but the game will actually treat it as some other player that the that will control I think that will be fine I just need to well actually this makes it easy in terms of the server because now that anything we set as a guest we automatically just set the slot to none so that's no big deal there will be some yeah we'll need to like go through some other parts of the code. But well, we can finish that up tomorrow. So yeah, I guess uh, thanks everybody for coming out and watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for spending the start of your week with me. Um, I'll be back tomorrow at around noon Eastern, just like normal. Um, I want to start streaming during the afternoon, but you know, I need to figure out some schedule. Um, but anyway, I have a YouTube channel where I post all old streams if you'd like to catch up wonder how the game looked a few weeks ago, you can check there. I also have a Discord server where you can um, chat with me throughout the day, I'd love to have you. And um, yeah, feel free to follow me here on Twitch to know when I go live tomorrow and I also post notifications on Twitter if that's more um, to your interest. And I'll put links in chat or you can check out the video description if you're on YouTube right now and yeah, I guess that's it. So I hope you all have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.